Hey everyone, this is your host Yoshino, and you are listening to another exciting episode of Artist Decoded. This is somewhat of a celebratory moment because this is episode number 150 of the podcast. And in this episode, I get the opportunity to talk to director and writer Riley Stearns. We talk about his recent 2019 film, which premiered at South by Southwest, entitled The Art of Self-Defense, starring Jesse Eisenberg. You can actually find this film on Hulu if you're subscribed to Hulu, and you can watch it there. It's a really great film with a lot of absurdity and a lot of nods to this idea of toxic masculinity, which we'll talk about in a bit. But here's a short synopsis on this film. After he's attacked on the street at night by a roving motorcycle gang, timid bookkeeper Casey, played by Jesse Eisenberg, joins a neighborhood karate studio to learn how to protect himself. Under the watchful eye of a charismatic instructor, Sensei, played by Alessandro Nivola, and hardcore brown belt, Anna, played by Imogen Poots, Casey gains a newfound sense of confidence for the first time in his life. But when he attends Sensei's mysterious night classes, he discovers a sinister world of fraternity, brutality, and hypermasculinity, presenting a journey that places him squarely in the sights of his enigmatic new mentor. Audacious and offbeat, The Art of Self-Defense is an original dark comedy that takes toxic masculinity to absurd extremes. This idea of toxic masculinity is a subject that I'm personally intrigued by, and I actually went on Wikipedia just to see what the quote-unquote definition of toxic masculinity is, in case you don't know. But toxic masculinity is the concept that is used in academic and media discussions of masculinity to refer to certain cultural norms that are associated with harm to society and to men themselves, Traditional stereotypes of men as socially dominant, along with related traits such as misogyny and homophobia, can be considered quote-unquote toxic, due in part to their promotion of violence, including sexual assault and domestic violence. The socialization of boys in patriarchal societies often normalizes violence, such as in the saying, boys will be boys, quote-unquote with regard to bullying, aggression, and harassment. And yeah, so this idea of toxic masculinity is something that me and my business partner, Justin Dosher Hopkins, shout out to JDH, we talk about a lot. Um, I'm glad that this conversation of hypermasculinity and toxic masculinity is talked about a lot now, and especially it's being revealed a lot more in our society through the media and through the actions of certain men that are in power and who abuse that power to be able to give a voice to people who have been mistreated and have been abused, I think is extremely important. And I think that the interesting thing about this in terms of the context of artwork is that a film such as this one points the finger at this idea of toxic masculinity and hypermasculinity to a mass audience to be able to hopefully inject these ideas to allow it to permeate and gestate within other people who might not share these exact opinions and approaches and to hopefully change mainstream culture as a whole. And yeah, this is a really interesting film. I'm glad that we were able, me and Riley, were able to discuss this idea of toxic masculinity. We also were able to talk about his writing process for the film. And something that I found that was really interesting that he told me in this conversation is that he actually wrote about six to seven scripts prior to shooting his first feature film, which was Faults, which came out and was premiered at South by Southwest in 2014. And yeah, it's it was interesting to understand his writing process and to talk about that. Riley also does Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He's a purple belt under Sean Williams, who is under Henzo Gracie. We talked about that too and how that was an entry point for him to creating the script for The Art of Self-Defense. Before we begin this episode, please go to our iTunes page and leave us a review. 
It helps for viewers just like yourself to hear about this podcast. And if you can't, that's fine. But if you can, that would be great. All right, here it is. My conversation with writer and director Riley Stearns for Artists Decoded. Hope you enjoy it. Thanks so much for coming and doing this. I really appreciate um, you for taking the time. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let's see. Olivia Chauve is the one who connected us. Sure. And I also know Simon. And Simon. So it's like Mr. both Cash. of those, which actually it was funny that you went through Olivia because Simon knows me probably just as well. Yeah. Not saying very, very well, but like enough. And But yeah, when, when Olivia reached out about doing this, I was, I, I was not familiar with the podcast, but yeah. uh, listened to a little bit of it and I was very excited to come be a part of it. Oh, cool. Yeah. Thanks, man. Wait, which which uh, podcast did you listen to? What did you sent me the Kit Dale one, or was that out yet? Or no, uh, I sent you the Eddie Bravo, the one. Eddie Bravo one. That's what it was, and I listened to a little bit of that, and I, I thought that was cool. I, obviously, we, I mean, not obviously, nobody knows this yet. We, we both train jujitsu, so mm-hmm. there's that crossover of being somebody who is involved in creative aspects of life, but then also wanting to better yourself in other ways too. And jujitsu has been that thing for me. So yeah, definitely wanted to check out the jujitsu stuff definitely. first. Yeah. Podcast yeah. wise. Yeah. So, so, okay. Speaking of the jujitsu stuff, like I'm curious why and when did you start jujitsu and did jujitsu and getting into jujitsu lead you into writing and directing the art of self-defense? So I started jujitsu in 2013. Um, uh, and then I, I, I had wanted to be, I wanted, I'd wanted to start training it three years prior to that. So in like 2010, I was working on a TV show called Tower Prep as a staff writer. And I had been watching MMA, but kind of like embarrassed that I was watching MMA. It was, I had just always seen it as this uh, thing that only like jocks and meathead sort of guys were into. And I didn't feel like I like related to those guys, but I also found something really striking and, and interesting about martial arts. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'd never really trained. I trained when I was five for a year until my dad like stopped getting free lessons for this art that he was doing for the uh, dojo. Oh. And so was I, it karate or I did karate when I was five. So I got my yellow belt and that was it. So, mm. but my dad did some artwork. My dad's a, a used to be an airbrush artist, like photorealistic airbrush artist. And so he did something for this Academy and they gave him lessons for myself and for him. Mm. And once those stopped, Stopped being free. He was like, well, I guess we're done. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, so uh, around like 26, I, I finally signed up, but I, yeah, again, three, three years of, of saying I'm going to do it and being too intimidated to walk through the doors. And then once I finally said, I'm going to do this, I'm going to go walk through those doors. It, you end up realizing that everyone else has that exact same kind of fear going in for the very first time, especially as an adult doing something like that later in, uh, in my mind at the time, I was like, Oh, I'm so old. And this is other people probably been training forever, but everyone has that kind of first day jitter sort of thing. And then you realize that everyone's there for the same reason to just learn something new and better themselves. And, uh, I really wanted to learn how to defend myself, but also watching MMA. I just thought it was so fascinating that the smaller, seemingly, uh, uh, weaker guy or girl, uh, could beat the bigger person, the bigger mm. opponent in a fight using jujitsu. And it took me a, set, a while to realize what jujitsu really was. But uh, once I did fi- figure out that thing that they were doing when they were rolling around on the ground was jujitsu, that I was decided that was going to be the thing that I took up. And uh, yeah, I started training in 2013 at Gracie Baja over in Glendale mm. uh, up under Robert Hill. And um, a couple of years later, uh, I was in New York for five months. So I trained with Marcelo Garcia at his academy. Nice. Uh, not with him. I mean, he was one of the, it's his school, but I trained at his academy. And I mean, that's, a uh, great, that's a great academy. It is one of the like world class academies. Um, mm-hmm. And that, I, I went from training like two times a week to when I was at Marcelo's going four or five times a week and doing more no gi, which is where you don't wear the gi and you don't have like the belt or anything like that. And I fell in love with it. And when I got back to LA, I realized I wanted more of that environment. And the school mm. I was at only offered one no gi class every two weeks. And yeah. that's not a lot. And yeah. the school that I'm at right now is, I want to say 60% no gi currently in the way mm. that it's broken up. And that's my game. And so, mm. yeah, I've been at Five Star Martial Arts, which is now Henzo Gracie, Los Angeles. It's been Henzo all along, but they're kind of calling themselves Henzo now. Yeah. Um, I've been there for, God, 
three-ish years maybe. And Very it's cool. been the best. I love that place yeah. so much. Yeah. Yeah. I'm surprised that uh, you didn't train over at Henzo's in New York. Well, I didn't train with Sean when I f- was in New York or sorry, I wasn't training with Sean yet. So mm-hmm. I was at Gracie Baja. So when I got, when I got to New York, Marcelo was that person that I had always watched videos of and thought I'm training at Marcelo Garcia's Academy no matter what. And then when I got back to LA, I tried a class over at, uh, um, Cobrinha's, which mm. is a uh, part of the same kind of organization Alliance. Yeah. And I didn't really respond to their, I don't know, their school, the way mm. it was run as, as much yeah. and no offense to them. It just wasn't as much of a me thing. And, yeah, it's fine. and, and so then I just a mile down the street, uh, on Wilshire is, is Sean Williams school. Mm. Uh, and that's where I ended up like falling in love with, uh, I fell in love with that school and, and everyone that was there. And I have, you could go as hard as you want. You could be really aggressive and people don't hurt each other though, too. Yeah. And, and there's, there's definitely academies that go, hard in a f- not fun way and yeah. then there's schools like ours that we go hard but we're taking care of each other yeah and yeah i just got back for, i just finished up comp class this morning competition class and then came over here so oh, cool, it's man. uh five days a week for me at least for that's awesome it's the best yeah yeah so i guess what what in the beginning made you want to create uh or start writing the art of self-defense like what was the first ideas going into the project and you know is it because of some of the martial arts background that led you to coming up with this, this story? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, um, I was a blue belt when I started writing self-defense. I, in fact, the title page I think has my name and then underneath it, it put, and I put in parentheses blue belt just because the movie talks a lot about associations with colors and your belt as being like a defining part of you. And, um, I knew I wanted to put something in the world of martial arts. I made a movie called faults a couple of years prior and uh, it's like a very small sort of uh, contained movie. And the next movie, I knew that I still wasn't going to be able to do something gigantic. And I was kind of toying around with a couple of ideas that weren't really going anywhere. And then I finally realized I should just set something in the world uh, that I enjoy and that I'm around all the time. And it would be cool to do something like that. Jiu-jitsu kind of threw that idea out the window right away because I, I just didn't want to have to explain what jujitsu was to people. Whereas karate, yeah. you can go anywhere in the world and, and 99% of the people will know what karate is. Mm-hmm. So, and then also I could play around with the tropes of karate and what a karate movie is supposed to be so that people are, I guess, thinking that it's going to go one direction and then you could change their expectations yeah. and subvert the, the expectations that they have. But, uh, yeah, I think the, the main thing, even though I wanted to set something in the world of martial arts, the most important thing for me was to kind of talk about what it means to be a man in today's society. And obviously conversations about toxic masculinity have been around forever, but yeah. at that time it wasn't really talked about the way that it is. So I wrote this in 2015, I'd never heard the term toxic masculinity. Uh, When I was writing it, that wasn't on my mind. It was more about my own thoughts and fears about what it is to be a man. Am I masculine enough? Am I what society's expectation of a man is supposed to be? Uh, Because I didn't feel like I was. And so I wanted to explore that through humor. I mean, very dark humor. um, (laughs) And setting it in a world like a karate machismo-y dojo Mm -hmm. just made sense to me. Uh, and yeah, it's just, it's funny how it's, it kind of morph. Like I always knew what it was about to me, but then after when it came out, I guess it was last year, 2019, mm-hmm. obviously the conversations have fully changed and shifted and uh, people are much more open about their own concerns and, and, uh, I don't know, directions that masculinity tend to be going. Yeah. Uh, and I think that it's all for the best, but my movie about my own personal thoughts and fears about masculinity has kind of turned into a toxic masculinity movie, Mm. which that was never the intent, but it's kind of cool that it has. Uh, And I know what the movie means to me, but I also like that other people have responded to it in a personal way for themselves. Definitely. Or even just like women watching it and being like, it's cool that a guy's talking about something that, uh, in, in a way that doesn't make it seem like it's this, uh, I don't know, th- like being able to talk about it in an honest way and definitely, and even through humor, obviously it's, it, that's all there, but it's definitely, it's, it's a takedown and just, mm-hmm. I don't know, making sure people know that guys can be very dumb at times oh. and, oh, yeah. and, definitely. uh, have no problem about making with making fun of myself and, and my mm-hmm. own masculinity in the process. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, yeah, that's what I really enjoyed about that film too, is that it opens up this conversation of toxic masculinity even further. 
And there was multiple scenes when there was that break room. And then there was those three guys mm -hmm. that, you know, had one of, one of them had this sort of like masculine, like highly masculine sort of magazine and, you know, and like all the visuals that are within the magazine. And then they're, they're talking about, Oh, um, uh, Hey, do you want to do pushups now? Yeah. 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 And things like that. And I think it's really interesting because it, it brings me back to, yeah, that idea of toxic masculinity, but also just growing up and being in situations where people are hyper machismo. But even in the movie, you know, I, I mean, spoiler alert, but you realize that, you know, maybe the reason why the main instructor who, um, self proclaims himself as sensei, mm -hmm. <laughs> he, you know, he, uh, you know, you realize that maybe he's been through a lot of trauma in life Yeah, and I'm not going to exactly give away how that is revealed, but I mean, at that point, you know, it challenges this idea of empathy, but then also knowing that this person is just a very, very bad person. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so it opens up the conversation even further, which I think makes it relevant. I it, The movie, for me, the, a lot of the humor came from <clears throat> being very literal about things and on the nose about it. It's not a subtle movie by any stretch of the imagination, and that was always kind of by design. So I know that some critiques of it uh, from, and not necessarily like reviews or whatever, but I know that there are people who wanted it to be a little bit more subtle. Mm. And for me it was more important to just go in and kind of hammer it over the head or hammer people over the head with the message, but also then at the same time, not making it a message film. Uh, I didn't want people to feel like they were being talked down to. Yeah. And I think that if you can like laugh at the situation and if you can kind of see the absurdity in it, you're not feeling like you're sitting in class, like some gender study class or something. It's just more, uh, yeah, like this, the subtlety is in the performance or like the delivery of a dialogue, a uh, piece of dialogue. Um, but the movie itself is all about, uh, I don't know, stereotypes and mm -hmm. uh, what, like, this is the stereotype of a man. He listens to metal. He has a German shepherd, like, uh, he does karate. But then as you were saying, I like to think that the sensei character, even though he's this cult like figure inside the dojo and he's the definition of a man and, and all the students look up to him when he leaves the dojo, I like to think that he probably gets made fun of still, or if he's around other guys, he doesn't feel like he relates to them as, as much. So he's got this kind of character that he's built around himself. Uh, and in his dojo, he gets to be that. Whereas when he walks around with his uh, tevas, his sandals with socks and like his like pseudo gi outside going to the grocery store. I would love to think that somebody probably has ac accosted him and he didn't stand up for himself because he's still dealing with his own issues and internally. So there's definitely, like you said, there's a, a little bit of empathy for the character, but at the end of the day, he's still sort of a psychopath. So like you don't really want to ever relate to him but you gotta like i don't want to ever look down on my characters or, or dislike my characters but he's still kind of an unlikable guy yeah. for sure yeah. yeah but i think like the i mean this idea of not being as subtle like i still don't think that you pander to peep to your audience i appreciate that i yeah uh, i don't think so at all i thought that overly explaining certain situations <laughs> kind of added to the surrealness of the situation totally you know yeah. like um, what's, what's a, what's a good example? Like, um, today you're going to learn how to punch with your foot. Yeah. That whole scene for sure. Like it's also, uh, it was important for me to, that the movie exists in this kind of just left of center world, uh, from ours. So, uh, I've heard it described before by the, I, I've met with people who their companies like to do things that aren't really grounded, but they're not super fantastical at the same time. They call it like a few inches off the ground. And I like to think that this world exists a few inches off the ground. It's like you can have a, a something like a, a German shepherd understanding the concept of your other left, mm -hmm. uh, whereas in this real world, a dog wouldn't understand that. And, and that that's okay. It exists in this world. Or that there are no repercussions. There's no police officers like investigating murders that are happening. Uh, it, like once something happens, it just kind of you brush it aside and then you don't worry about it anymore because that's what the movie needed. It was more about creating, I don't know, an overall feel and, and it's, it's, it was fun to experiment with like how far should I go or not go. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I also like the, uh, you know, the dog is almost like a metaphor for, uh, I mean, it's a wiener dog. Yeah. The dachshund. Yeah. yeah. The dachshund. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it's, it's kind of like a metaphor for his own idea of his masculinity. Yeah. Um, and it's embodied and imbued through this animal, which, you know, 
uh, in the animal's context, it doesn't, it's just, it's just a dog. It's just a dog. It's just a dog. But in the movie, it's like, this is a feminine dog. Mm -hmm. A dachshund is a feminine dog. A German shepherd's a masculine dog. And obviously like, it's so like silly and on the nose, but I feel like that was the fun in figuring out how is this going to work and how are we going to be able to like say something even as ridiculous as it is. Um, the movie, I wouldn't say the movie is based on my own experiences. Like, obviously I have never been like in a cult like environment with some <laughs> murderous sensei or whatever, but I also, but uh, there are elements of myself in this. And so owning a dachshund, like I, my parents have her now, but my dog Diddy is a dachshund and like, uh, I obviously I train jujitsu and, and I, I listen to metal personally, like it, it was important to put those pieces of myself in there, but then also never have it feel like it has to be me. It has to be true to who I am. Yeah. Uh, it, it was about creating its own thing. Hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, I definitely relate on that. Uh, the listening to metal thing. I grew sure. Up, yeah. I grew up listening to metal. Actually, I forgot the other thing that I listened to. It was a little bit of your uh, daughter's. Uh, I forget. I always forget oh, his yeah. name. Uh, but Alexis. Yeah, 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 yeah. I listened a little bit of that, too. And I even loved there was a moment where you started talking about like Canada songs, which is a much more like screamy, uh, yeah. grindcore sort of yeah. style. And they've de- definitely transitioned away from that. But I was in high school when that came out. And that was like, it took me a while to get used to the newer version of Daughters. I wanted the more aggressive and like uh, abrasive version. But you talking about that, it almost like, it felt like I could see him sinking in his chair a little bit going like, oh yeah, that our old stuff. But I I like, I tend to, I mean, I'm wearing a full of hell hat right now, which is uh, the band that we used in the movie. Um, But that, that's all part of me. And I I feel like the metal community takes themselves maybe a little too seriously sometimes. My favorite bands are the ones who are super brutal and make really great stuff, super technical stuff. And they are a bunch of dorks too. Mm -hmm. I like my friends, uh, uh, my friend Mitch is in this band called Thou and they make really great, like sludgy, slow, brutal uh, metal. And they go up on stage and they're wearing baseball caps and flip flops and shorts and stuff. And like they can make the heaviest stuff, but then also just basically look like a jam band. Mm. I like that kind of stuff. Like I, I, when something takes itself too seriously in any aspect of life, I find that off putting. Mm. So yeah, just being your, I I mean the, the silly thing about my movie is I would say that at the end of the day, it's uh, as, as cheesy as it sounds, it's all about just trying to just be yourself. Yeah. And it's a simple message but I think uh, I'm guilty of it too, uh, forgetting to just be myself a lot of the time. Mm. I've stopped really caring about what people think of my uh, of me, and and that's been the past three years. Really, just like trying to figure out like who am I and what do I want to do and how do I want to be, and is that okay? And the answer is yes. Like just mm. whatever's normal for you, whatever's the your like baseline, that's okay to be like that. You don't have to be this expectation of what other people want you to be. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. interesting. Yeah. It's, I, <clears throat> I think it's interesting how certain aspects within our lives, whether it's like through childhood or whether it's through, you know, certain interactions that you have, like in your adolescence or, um, you know, going, just going through different traumas and things in your life, how you internalize that. And, you know, even in the sensei character, you know, but where you know that he's had a divorce that situation, you know, you can either go in a couple different directions or you can go in multiple different directions where you can go the route of empathy and like understanding and go internal and, you know, self-actualize and understand, okay, well, you know, maybe I was at fault for these certain things. Or you can go the other route where you just bury it into your subconscious and allow yourself to basically go haywire and be a, you know, like, (laughs) and he took the latter route. Yeah. He definitely took that route that you're talking about. Like, exactly. It's funny. I, yeah. So there, the character, the sensei character, like you said, spoiler, um, I, I do put like a little shot in the movie where he's, he's still got a photo of him and his wife on his, on their wedding day in his desk. And on the back, it, we never show what it says, but it's uh, um, like something to her, love always, one of those things. Mm. And it's just to kind of show that he still has that, he's still holding on to those emotions about that person, yeah. but that something happened, obviously, and they're not together anymore. And I feel like that informed his maybe, not necessarily hatred of women, but like feeling of like uh, he's better than women yeah. uh, or 
learn that men are better than women, but it's through a personal trauma sort of situation. Mm -hmm. And that was always in the script. Uh, and, and then, yeah, I got, uh, right before we made the movie, I ended up getting divorced. Um, I was with somebody for 14 and a half years. Wow. And so it's funny how like little things that were already in the script then took on new meaning personally and never not like it's not in the same sort of way. I definitely didn't go the aggressive murderous route. Uh, I went the more like sad. I've got to work on like myself and work on my art sort of route. And like you said, everyone has different ways of dealing with traumas. Uh, and I feel like this movie ended up being kind of the perfect thing at the exact right time that I needed it. And I don't believe in fate, but uh, the fact that Jesse signed on when he did and that happened right when it did. Jesse, Definitely, yeah, Jesse Eisenberg. Jesse yeah, Eisenberg, yeah. The actor. He, yeah. He, he said yes to the movie at a, like a month after I kind of started going through the divorce process. Mm. And I was able to go off and shoot in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, uh, I guess Jesse said that he wanted to make the movie in around, like I would say, June. And by August, I was in Kentucky prepping the film. And we started shooting in September. Is that so, in 2017? 17. Okay. So, yeah. And then the movie came out in 2019. But in 2017, like, I went through a divorce and I made my second feature. And the feature happening when it did definitely helped me focus on something else other than real life for a bit. And that was hugely important. But then what I did also realize is that while I was making the movie, I wasn't dealing with issues that I was like, I should have been dealing with. And rightly so. I was, I was, I had to put every single bit of myself into this movie. Um, but then when I got back and I started editing and you don't have that same sort of like lack of downtime that you have on a set where everyone's asking you questions like every second of the day. And even when you leave set, you're thinking about the movie. Now, all of a sudden, I'm back in Los Angeles editing uh, blocks away from where I live. And so there wasn't really like that same amount of constant go, go, go. Mm -hmm. And you realize, oh, I didn't really deal with some stuff. And now real life is about to happen. And once you finish editing, then even more so you go, shit, now I've got to fully deal with myself. Mm. And so th while the movie happened at the exact right moment, and I think that it was the best thing that could have happened, it also ended up being uh, sort of, I don't know, it, it was putting a Band-Aid on something mm. that then once the movie was done, then I had to really say, okay, let's figure yourself out. Let's like, let's work on you, whatever that is. I traveled a bit. I did tons of jujitsu. And then la this time last year, or I guess a little bit before, so like a, a year and Four months ago, I wrote another script that I'm hoping mm. to make this year. It's just been like a little slower going than I would have liked, but uh, I've got those things now, and and I've already, yeah, not saying that everything's perfect, but it's it's going in the right direction, and I feel like myself more so than I've ever felt in a yeah. weird way. That's been good. Yeah, I think it's interesting too. Just I mean, speaking of getting divorce, and uh, I talked about this. Um, recently, I, I've actually never talked about this on the podcast. So this mm -hmm. is the first time I'm going to talk about it on the podcast with you. Yeah. Because we can relate on Because we subjects. can relate. Nobody else is here. It's just us, man. Yeah. Yeah. Just us. No one's going to listen to this. Um, it is me uh, on the podcast. Nobody will listen to this. It's, <laughs> I'm, I'm fully aware of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know about that. Um, but, uh, you know, you're, you're an interesting guy. You know, Thanks. you have interesting things to say. Um, yeah. You know, when you're, when you're in a relationship, you know, whether it's you're married or, you know, you've been in a relationship for a very long period of time and it's like potentially your first love, like there's a lot of sort of like identity that gets wound up in the compilation of two people coming together as one. I know exactly what that feels like. Yeah. yeah. And then trying to understand, you know, like going forward and even like dating new people and going forward and, and, and like just understanding like, wait, who am I without this person? And then people are asking in like situations where you're in like, um, uh, like a group setting, you know, right. Like if people don't know, they're like, Oh, where's blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then you're like, and then you have to explain. And then you just see like the life slightly draining from their face. Cause they feel, they explain. feel horrible. And you're like, yeah. Oh no, it's not you. But like, it's impossible for it not to feel awkward when that kind of stuff comes up for sure. Yeah. Definitely. Especially when somebody fully didn't know mm. and they, they're so, so excited to talk about something. And, but exactly what you're saying, you feel kind of intertwined, like your personality it, before the divorce is you and another person. And mm. then coming out of that, you have to learn how to just be yourself. 
Yeah. And that's fucking hard. Mm-hmm. Like it took me, I'm still figuring it out, obviously, but it took a long time to be okay with like just being me and not thinking about myself as like part of a, a unit. Mm. And that's, that's tricky. I think that was one of the hardest things was just going, who am I out, outside of the context of a marriage? Yeah. And that's easier said than figured out for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm actually curious because recently I've been watching a lot of Cassavetti's films, mm-hmm. but also I recently watched A Marriage Story. Yeah. Same. Uh, Noah Baumbach. Mm-hmm. Being someone that has had a divorce, what did you think about the, the movie in the context of like what they were going through? I was very afraid to watch it. Mm. Like very. Really? Yeah. I, I didn't mm. want to watch it in a theater, um, but I was in Poland at a film festival and they were going to be screening it. And a couple of the other filmmakers that I had met and become friends with uh, were going to go see it. And I kind of said, like, why am I afraid? Just It's just a movie. Then the opening of that movie uh, is the montage of kind of like them reading their letters or at least Adam Driver reading his letter Mm -hmm. and uh, started crying immediately, Mm. like immediately. And I was like, fuck, this is going to be hard. And then a couple of like a minute later, he has this or she has this thing in her letter where she says he cries easily during movies. And then I'm sitting there crying. She says that about him. And then I just start laughing. Mm. And I was like, it's, it's fine. This is going to be fine. Definitely had moments that hit close to home. But then I was really, really excited be, by the fact that it ended up having a sense of humor mm. um, and a levity to it that I wasn't expecting, which I should have expected. It's Noah Baumbach. Um, but I thought it was going to be heavier at times than it was. And then uh, oh, where was I also going with that? Uh, I was also surprised. Oh, in that it's not really about divorce as it as much about divorce as it is about custody. And because I didn't have a kid mm. or we didn't have a child, um, yeah. there wasn't that same sort of thing that has to be figured out. Mm-hmm. Like not to get too into it, but like we just, once it happened, I was just like, I went out like, let's, let, it's done. Yeah. And let's just make it as clean and easy as possible so mm. that we both can go on with our lives. Yeah. Uh, and the, the whole custody issue, I, I can only imagine how incredibly hard that would be in real life. And the movie does, a I mean, from an outsider's perspective, it does a great job of dealing with the subtleties and intricacies of that. I think so, too. Uh, and I know that some people would argue that his character seems to get the sh- better end of things in terms of, like, the way that Noah wrote the characters. But I still feel like both of them are at fault at times, and it doesn't ever put all the blame on one person. But... Yeah, I think that that once I realized that the movie wasn't my story, which obviously it wouldn't have been, but for some reason I was just convinced it was going to be only uh, all these things were going to get hit too close to home. Yeah. Once it wasn't that, then I really enjoyed it. Mm. Yeah. And I ended up probably being my favorite film of the year because of personal experiences. And then Parasite was second. Oh, oh yeah. But Parasite in a couple of years, I may be like marriage story doesn't have that same resonance where with me anymore, whereas parasite still does. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think that's interesting. Like just, you know, viewing artwork in general, whether it's like a film or music or a painting, there's obviously the experience of what the artist is creating for the, for the audience, you know, or for themselves. And then that's projected through the audience. But these certain projections that we have based off of our own personal experiences yeah. and our baggage that we bring into a lot of situations and whether that situations like this conversation mm-hmm. where we're talking about our experiences or, you know, a situation where you're watching a film such as, you know, like when I was watching your film, Art of Self-Defense, you know, I, I enjoyed like those certain details where it was uh, absurd. Mm-hmm. Like I could tell that you like that sort of absurd absurdity. <laughs> sure. And, uh, and also just, you know, like, I guess my projection would be like the, the whole martial arts thing in that, you know, uh, something just comes up in my head, like Instagram's McDojo life. Yeah. 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 You know, just how, totally. how like, um, if you got, if, if, if anyone hasn't been to McDojo life, you must, must check this it's out. It's all about like using force and chi and like just phony martial arts. And yeah. he kind of calls people out for it. Yeah. 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 It's pretty, pretty brilliant. I actually, there was one where there was, I think 10 people around this guy and they all like were right, right, right up against or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Right up against like him with a knife. And then 
his defense was to like turn to his right and then like scoot out of the situation it's like so as if silly. that would actually happen it's the silliest stuff yeah, yeah exactly what you're saying is it, I, that's how i find like any type of art like you're saying like it can be a painting it can be music music is so funny too how much how different some songs mm-hmm. felt uh after the divorce as opposed to how they felt before mm-hmm. like how they're all of a sudden you listen to lyrics in a different way and I suddenly was relating to lyrics, which I never, I'm, I'm a, I have a background in playing bass and guitar. Mm. And I always think of the music rather than the lyrics. Like I don't sing along to lyrics. I sing along to a guitar part, mm-hmm. like in my car. Yeah. And all of a sudden lyrics meant way more than they had before. And I was finding, I was crying listening to lyrics because that all of a sudden made me feel like they, this person wrote it for me. Um, mm. The Farewell was a movie that I really enjoyed last year. But I never, I never felt that emotional resonance that some other people felt because they maybe had just lost a loved one. Mm. And watching that movie, like there were people next to me who were bawling their eyes out. Mm. And I didn't, I, I didn't feel like a bad person, but I also was like, I wish I could relate to it the way that they are. But at the same time, I'm glad that I can't or I'm not because that would have meant that I was dealing with some, some tra- recent trauma or even yeah. not even recent, just yeah. some trauma mm-hmm. that it hit close to home. And so I, I love that about any sort of art that we all have our own way of coming at it and relating to it. And I may think that my movie's about something, but if somebody else gets something out of it in their own way, then who's to say who's right or wrong? Like the movie now exists in the world and it's to be there for other people to enjoy, hopefully, Mm. uh, however they enjoy it. That's not up to me. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. And I think, you know, going back to Jesse Eisenberg's character in, in the film, the reason why he chooses martial arts and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's also this sort of sense that he doesn't know who he is Yeah, and he doesn't have conviction in his own ideas. And he's kind of this lost, like, a uh, person in his mid thirties trying mm-hmm. to navigate through the world. And you can imagine that this person has been constantly bullied as, as a kid. And he's, you know, he's an accountant. I don't know what that necessarily has to do with it. But <laughs> it's know. just like the, again, going back to stereotypes, <laughs> like yeah. if you're, if you're like an accountant, an accountant, you're probably not somebody who's able to defend themselves or like, uh, you're not as masculine or whatever it is. Like that's just the blanket stereotype of like an office sort of job as yeah. opposed to a karate mm-hmm. school sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, even speaking about the movie, it seems like the advent of becoming, um, I, I want to say becoming a victim to toxic masculinity, but more so just allowing like toxic, toxic masculinity to seep into your life is because you don't, Either you're hiding things or you're hiding from things or you don't deal with these certain traumas mm-hmm. and then they manifest through other ways that you deal with things in the in the real world. Yeah. And um, I think that I think that's a very good conversation. I actually had a, a conversation with someone the other day, which was very concerning. <laughs> and it was like kind of a toxic masculinity situation where. Um, I might have talked about this on the podcast once before, but um, you haven't heard it, so I'm going to tell you. Please. (laughs) So I was in this conversation, and uh, the first, I was I was more so just like listening to this conversation, and I was so there was two people across from me, and they were having this conversation about politics. One was uh, more of a Republican, the other one was more libertarian, and the guy that was Republican, he was an Asian guy. uh, I think he was Korean, around the same age as me early thirties. And he was just talking about this trauma that he went through and how he didn't deal with that trauma when he was a kid. It was pertained to his father and his father, uh, cheating on his mother that he found out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he said he was in his about seven. And then when he was in his early twenties, he confronted his dad about it because I guess he has like a yearly drinking session with his dad Mm. and, uh, and he just kind of let it out on him but how he's carried that trauma through his entire life and still carries it today and how he was telling me how he just hardens himself and how that perspective, what I've been got was what I was gathering is that he, he, that hardening perspective has like dictated his actions through work, through the way he treats his wife, through a lot of things because he hasn't properly dealt with these traumatic situations and he doesn't, think that therapy actually works and it's fascinating how many guys don't believe in therapy too men on the whole i mean it's a blanket statement but don't do therapy and it's crazy to me like i don't i don't do it all the time 
but I've done it. And I do think that even just talking to somebody helps, even just talking to friends helps. And like, I, it's so interesting to me how many guys can't even say to their friend that they're feeling sad or that they're confused or that they like have some, that they're dealing with depression because that's perceived as weak mm. and, or that they just don't want their friends to think they're like, like, I don't know, weak. And that's such a silly thing to me because then once you bring it up, then you realize the other guy thought the same thing. And that now that you're opening up, they open up. And I feel like whether it's therapy or groups of friends, guys just tend to not do it. But when they do open up, I think that it it creates change and I think it can make you a better person, but exactly what you're saying. I, I I hear that from people all the time. Yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Well, I, I, I think like, uh, what I've come to the conclusion of, and maybe this is informed, um, actually this is informed by martial arts is just the idea of balance. And, you know, I think, I mean, you can even relate this to the Tao or, or Buddhism in general, but just being able to balance yourself out. And also, I mean, have you read this book? I mean, I read this, um, maybe about five or six years ago, but it left a lasting impression on me was, uh, the way of the superior man by David data. No, I haven't. It talks about how masculinity and femininity exists in all of us. And whether you're a more feminine male Mm -hmm. or more masculine male to be able to own up to those, um, to just the way you naturally are. And it's basically talking about how, um, you know, just be okay with, with who you are. The more conviction that you have with that, the more that that resonates in the energy that you put out there. It's probably a better worded version of what I tried to do with my movie. Like that, it sounds like exactly (laughs) what that book is talking about is what I, like by the end of the film, that's sort of the idea is that everyone has elements of hardness and softness in them, whether, and then in terms of genders, everyone has elements of femininity or masculinity. But then even more than that, it's like, well, then are they feminine or masculine? If we all have them in us, why can't it just be like that you are who you are? It doesn't have like uh, a lot of Q and A's during the festival circuit for the film. The question would come up inevitably: uh, do, what, is, what is your version of masculinity? And it's a cheesy again. Going back to the the answer, it's a cheesy answer, but it's just be yourself. Like I don't necessarily if you're if you're saying that it's like. I have 80% masculinity in me and 20% femininity. That doesn't make any sense. It's just like, no, you're, you're, ver- you're your own version of who you are. So mm. I, I honestly, even just using words like masculinity and femininity now just feel weird too. And I think that in a, in like five to 10 years, it's going to feel so archaic to even talk about masculinity or femininity because yeah. it's just like everyone's their own mix of everything. So yeah. I don't know. It's, it's, it's stuff that I think about a lot, definitely more so when I was writing this, it was mm-hmm. really on my mind. Um, and through writing it and through making the film, I feel like I've figured out more about who I am. And it's not necessarily that I figured out more about who I am as a man, just I've figured out more of who I am as a person in mm. general. Yeah. 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 And I think like, yeah, it's really interesting too, just to, you know, as you go through all these experiences and how you realize that, you know, maybe ideas that you've had 10 years ago were short-sighted and myopic, Yeah, you know? Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm Maybe that's a projection. <laughs> no, I mean, I think we all, but uh, it, you know. like we're, we're used to, once something is brought up and that you like, I, I don't, I, I identify as man, uh, but I understand now because of talking to other people and learning about other people that not everyone feels like they're one or the other and, and that's okay. And even just five years ago, my brain would have been able to, I guess, understand it in uh, like theoretically, but not really be able to kind of empathize with that. And I think that just being able to talk to people and meet people, then it opens up your perspective or horizons to new perspectives. And, and so like, yeah, my version of myself five years ago, maybe wouldn't have understood the same way to talk about something that I do now. Mm -hmm. And I think we're all learning, always learning. So yeah, yeah, I'm just really excited about like the next generation, Mm -hmm. like that they're what they're pushing for and how they're kind of changing perspectives of, of, of self. Yeah. And I think it's going to be the healthiest thing. It's just, it, it's hopefully only going to get better. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Being able to approach things with more empathy and just understanding, I think, you know, yeah, I mean, it can just make things so much better. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious about your writing process. Um, maybe <clears throat> if you see things just kind of as like, um, this is like an overarching thing in general, by the way you write, do you, you know, when you're first starting to write a script, 
do you put a bunch of ideas out there? I mean, David Lynch was saying in his master class that he creates, I mean, this is very Lynchian, <laughs> you know, he says he puts together like 70 of his best ideas at that time and mashes it into a, a movie. But yeah. I'm just curious because, you know, I've been, I've been writing, maybe this is a selfish kind of answer or a question, but um, I've been writing a lot recently and just kind of like understanding these little aspects of me yeah. and then trying to compile it into, you know, a, a, a fiction story or I'm curious what your writing process is. Yeah. So like, I wish I was like Paul Thomas Anderson or somebody like him who mm. he writes every day. He says he writes like at least five pages a day, maybe more. Even if it's not for a movie, it's not going to ever be used in something else. He just has this, this thing where he's like, it's a muscle and I want to exercise it. And so like I go to jujitsu five days a week, Paul Thomas Anderson writes five days a week, let's say, and he's only going, that's why he's so good. Cause he's like getting practice at it. And I am kind of not that. And I, I think about an idea for sometimes up to a year before I actually say I'm ready to write it. But that percolation period is very important to me. And I feel like I fix a lot of problems or I figure out solutions, uh, maybe is the better way of saying it. And then I also, um, I feel like I can kind of live in the world a little bit before I start actually putting it to paper. But I always go in with a plan. I, my very first, like I probably wrote six or seven scripts before my first feature faults. And, but then between faults and that last feature that I wrote prior to that it was probably a five year gap. So I like I wrote a ton when I was started at 17 to like 26 was when I wrote faults, uh, maybe 25. I can't remember 26. Uh, I wrote a lot leading up to that, but like it was all shit. It was me trying to figure out how to write. And so I think my very first script, I didn't outline a single thing. It was just kind of as it came and it reads that way. It's so messy. It doesn't have any focus. It doesn't make sense structurally. It's just like, it, it, yeah, it, I was going to throw a movie under the bus, but I'm not going to do that because I'm, I'm a nice person. Um, mm. it, it felt just like it felt like my style was me at that time. It was me figuring out how to do things and when, who mm. I was, then I made uh, when you made faults. So fault. I, I think once I wrote faults, I had already I had figured out who I was as a writer. I see. So I think leading up to it, those those six or seven features that I wrote leading up to it, I had my Wes Anderson ripoff script that I wrote, where it was just like, how do I write this cutesy, like mm. very perfect sort of thing? I had my Tarantino ripoff script, which was like very much me just style copying his style of dialogue, and mm. I had my sort of Eternal Sunshine sort of script that dealt with dreams yeah. and all of them are so bad, but they also, and don't, nobody will ever see them. Uh, if anybody has them, please never release them. Uh, what's great though, is that they all yeah. led to who I am and how I, my process as a writer. Yeah. And so with faults, uh, I knew exactly what that script was going to be. I'd written a very, very, um, sparse, but like to the T outline for the movie. So it's a very simple movie. It all takes place basically within one, one motel room. And so I knew what that structure was going to be going into a, the writing process on that. And then once I decided I was going to write it, I wrote it in two weeks. So mm -hmm. that was just like, go, go, go. But I had thought about the idea for at least eight months prior to that. Mm -hmm. So I also am not a big rewriter. I feel like rewriting, I, I don't know. I saw this meme recently. If I think a friend sent it to me of uh, a person walking down the catwalk, like in a fashion show. And they have all these different pieces of clothing all over them. And it's just like patchwork and crazy and obviously doesn't look good. But uh, it, it said like what your script looks like after it's gone through uh, all the network rewrites or whatever it is. <laughs> sort of like a TV writer meme or whatever. Yeah. And it, I totally could relate to that because I feel like often my gut instinct and the, the structure that I've already set in place is done for a reason. And uh, even on set, I'll often have times where I, I look at the script and I go, why did I do that? And I kind of say, oh, that doesn't seem right. Maybe we should change it. And then inevitably I'll see something or think or remember something and go, no, I did that because of this. I, I, I talked to Jesse Eisenberg about this. I often find myself just saying, trust the script, the person who sat with it and wrote it in a quiet room or at a coffee shop. And that's all they were thinking about at that time because they were probably right. If you try to change things on set, you're going to mess something up because you forgot that the something had to be there for this certain reason. So I often just feel like my stuff is ready to go. 
for better or for worse, I feel like I'm a first draft kind of writer. Um, and self-defense was a, not exactly the same thing, but I had had I sat with the idea for probably six months mm-hmm. before I started writing it. Um, and that was more of a like two month process, but it also still just felt organic and natural. Um, I didn't have that same need to get it done in two weeks. And so that's why it didn't really happen that way. But then the most recent script I wrote, similar thing, I had the idea for for probably two years was making self-defense, didn't want to like kind of go into that world yet because it also started, reali- I realized how even though the story I came up with prior was prior to the divorce, a lot of the stuff from the divorce started like matching up mm. with the script. Mm. And so it wasn't necessarily a movie about divorce, but it also felt personal in that sort of way. And so I think I needed some time to really dive into it and start writing it. But once I did, that was another two week writing process. And I'm super proud of the next movie, uh, the, the script for the next movie. And I'm very, very anxious to get, get rolling on it. But yeah, my process is to go in prepared and, but then not so prepared that you don't let yourself discover things in the process of writing. Cause I do find that some of the, my favorite stuff that I've written ends up being something that wasn't really planned. Like the scene is exactly as planned in, ter- in the sense that it comes at a certain point in the script but then this moment happens in that scene that flips the script in a really interesting way. Mm. Um, I, I would use faults as an example, but because you haven't seen it, I don't want to ruin anything. But there's, there's this, this thing in faults that I did with a doorknob that comes back later in the movie. And that was not in the outline. And had I not figured that out, I don't think the movie would have worked the same way that it did. I would have mm. had to construct some weird thing that would have happened that made the story happen the way that I wanted it to. Whereas in the writing, I all of a sudden found this like really easy fix that all, I wouldn't, I don't even think it's an outlinable thing. It just happened because once you're in that space with the characters, you can kind of close your eyes and you say, what would they do? And there's this doorknob and then they, they do this thing with it. And then all of a sudden it fixed all the problems that I was going to have later on. Hmm. So I like that, that kind of, uh, not being strict about certain things, but then also being very strict about structure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would I would say I kind of mix things up, but I don't write every day. I don't I don't think about ideas, um, multiple ideas. I tend to have one idea and focus on that. I'm trying to get better about focus multitasking. Mm. I've got a TV show that I'm kind of trying to develop right now, and I've, I would have never done that in the past while I had a script sitting and waiting to get made. Yeah. But now I'm trying to be active. I want to I want to work all, all, the, all the time. I want to make stuff and. I love making stuff, uh, and part of that is is just like going out and getting it. So mm-hmm. I'm making sure that I'm I'm staying active. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I have a couple of things um, just parlaying off of that, but yeah, I mean, I think you know having that gestation process is super important. Um, you know, maybe if you made a film like while you're in film school and you were greenlit for a film it would be totally different. And, you know, maybe you wouldn't have been prepared at that time. I don't think I would have been prepared. Yeah. And I also, as an aside, I I got rejected from the film program at my university. So I dropped out and, uh, which university, university of Texas at Austin. Uh, I only did one year there applied to the film program and they said, you don't have anything to show. Like you don't have any scripts or movies. And I was like, yeah, because I want to learn how to do them. Mm. They're like, that's not how it works. You have to have like a portfolio to get into film school. Mm. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense. So mm. I ended up dropping out. And I wonder what kind of things I would be making now had I gone through a traditional film program. But mm. I also, and I, I think that I could have made, been myself and done that kind of thing. But I also like that I ended up kind of figuring it out on my own Mm. and maybe made some choices that had I gone through a traditional program and been classically trained, whatever that means, uh, I wonder if I would have gone a slightly different route and what, how that would have affected my films, but I'm glad that it's worked out the way that it has still. Definitely. Yeah. 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 Well, it also seems that you put yourself through that process of self-educating yourself and being able to essentially kill your idols. You know, you were talking about uh, writing your Wes Anderson remake or like your Quentin Tarantino. Like rip off, yeah. yeah. rip off, you know? And like, yeah, and I think it's really important to understand when when you need to kill your idols. Yeah. You know, because if you create something that is exactly a direct replica of something else, then 
you don't really have your own voice, but you can have an amalgamation of different experiences and different films that you watch that have that little, the little spark that you like from that thing. And that, that's what helps inform you in the writing process as well. I, uh, I was listening to this podcast recently and I posted on my Twitter the other day. It's only four minutes long, but it's like a creative podcast. I'd never, I don't really listen to a lot of stuff like that, but this one thing, because I've been learning mandolin, I just really like the sound of mandolin. So I bought one before Christmas and I've been playing it a lot, except for I fucked up my finger yesterday. So that might put a, (laughs) I may not do that for a second, but uh, there's this guy named Chris Thiele, who's the mandolinist. He's like a virtuoso. He won the MacArthur Genius Grant. Uh, yeah, what's that? He's, he's pretty incredible. <laughs> yeah. he's, he's like, and his music yeah. is just so brilliant. He's playing Bach, like all from memory on the mandolin because it's strung up like a violin so you can play all those same suites. Mm-hmm. And uh, this, this guy who runs this podcast, his family got him a mandolin for Christmas and so he started learning it. And what, the, what was the first thing that he picked up? He's like, oh, I really like Chris Thiele. I'm going to try to learn this one little part of a song. And it's so stupid that that's where his, he's talking about, like, why did I go for the hardest thing first? And it's because of people who have creative inclinations tend to also have aspirations that maybe are higher than what their ability is actually able to do. Mm. So I, am, I know exactly what that feels like, particularly with this mandolin stuff. I know what really good mandolin sounds like. And so, of course, my brain immediately wants to make stuff like that. Like I make movies that I'm very proud of and they're I'm, I'm like reaching, but I'm attain, it's attainable stuff. And I know the tone that I'm going after. Whereas in the mandolin, I'm trying to learn these things. And it's just so incredibly hard that I can't sound as good as I want to sound. Mm. And I know that that just comes with time. So he has this thing about um, aspirations versus, versus actual physical ability. And as long as you stick with it long enough you will catch up. I may never be a Chris Thiele, but I'll at least be able to like sitting in my bedroom, be able to play a couple of things that he plays and go like, Oh, that sounds good. Or at least make stuff that one day I, I, I wouldn't be embarrassed to play in front of my friends. And, and I think that having those like, so uh, similar to the Chris Thiele thing, when I was younger and I was trying to write like my idols, I think that that's an important thing to try to attain and try to figure out why some of their stuff works and then also see why, even though you may be able to mimic a style, why it isn't your style. And so I think it took me enough of those, my, I went through it enough where I was trying to mimic those people that I really admired yeah. and, and to, to go, okay, I understand how that kind of works and I may not be as good at that sort of thing as they are, but you learn little tricks and tips along the way that kind of then start seeping in and forming your style. And I would say the same thing, like when I was younger and picking up, I don't know, I was playing along with new metal tracks and it wasn't necessarily the hardest stuff in the world, but I was like, oh, I want to learn this corn song or Slipknot song or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Like it's good to have those things that you can say, this is the kind of thing I listen to. I want to learn how to play that. And then I never ended up starting a new metal band, yeah. but like I won, I picked up things that then translate to, oh, I've, I'm getting into jazz. And because you set the groundwork, now you're getting better and you're able to play the stuff that you really want to play. So I think it, yeah, I don't know. The, the idols, it's important for us to try to mimic. Um, but at a certain point, it's best to be able to say, okay, that's, that's cool, but now who am I? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah and I, I feel like a lot of people you know, whether they're musicians or just people in general, they don't find that point where they realize that they're old, um, the sort of like old sort of things that they were into, like, you know, old music that they were into, they carry that into their thirties and forties and fifties and they almost are stuck in that time capsule. Yeah. And I'm sure, you know, you and I can both think of people that, um, that are potentially like that. But I mean, you know, I, I guess like, the interesting thing about utilizing these various mediums to create, whether it's film or whatever, you know, there's always that underlying sense of, or maybe overlying sense of curiosity and constantly being curious and constantly learning and constantly growing and, you know, trying to, um, I don't know, I guess, I guess I'm more inclined to want to be around people that are constantly curious because it invigorates my spirit to want to learn new things and understand new things. And, um, that's just kind of like the situations I put myself in as I'm, as I've gotten older, as opposed to when I was younger, maybe, you know, out of like just youthful hubris being around people that weren't as good as me at like skateboarding for instance, or those sort of things. You know, but I feel like sometimes people just don't even grow out of that and they just are constantly because their ego or whatever 
they only surround themselves with people that are below them. You know? Yeah. I also, <clears throat> I've, I, I think going along with the curiosity thing, I've always been a person who f- wants to pick up new hobbies. Mm. And so to a fault almost too. Like too. I feel like I collect <laughs> hobbies <laughs> and, <too. laughs> and a really funny thing is that when I found jujitsu, I realized that instead of collecting more hobbies, all of a sudden now I had all these techniques that I started collecting. So jujitsu kind of became this outlet where because I was constantly learning something, it never got stagnant. And in seven years of training, I've never been bored because every single day you learn something. Even if you learn what not to do, you learn something. Mm-hmm. And But I, I still, like, I actually have an idea for a podcast about hobbies. Like, I want to talk to people who, like, their hobby is soldering, like, little circuits. Or mm-hmm. their hobby is, uh, I don't know, making quilts. Or what, I, I just find it fascinating that people find something, especially people who are older, like later in life saying, I'm so curious. Like that's, that's a huge part of who I am is, is constantly wanting to learn about something and why it works. And I'm not a handy person, so I'm not like taking apart things to see how they work, but I love, I love that other people do that. And I love that I've found things along the way. Like even now, if you would have told me when I was a teenager that and when I was 33, I'd suddenly be dis- listening to traditional bluegrass and trying to learn mandolin. I would have like said, there's no way I'm that dumb and, or like that dorky. Yeah. Uh, but the fact that I am doing this is just, it's, it kind of goes back to, and it proves that I'm still curious. Like I'm still wanting to take up things and yeah. still wanting to learn new things. And I hope I am always sort of that person. Yeah. I, I've always felt like directors are sort of jack of all trades. Like mm. I'm not... I can do everything on set within reason, but I'm not going to ever be good at like really great at any of those particular jobs. So all the department head jobs, like I know how to play music, but I'm not a composer. Mm. I know how to run a camera, but I'm not a DP. Like I understand why I want certain costumes look a certain way, but I would never in a million years want to be a costume designer. But I love that as a director, you get to find all these people who are way better at something uh, than you. And you put all those people in charge of these individual departments and you get to oversee it. But then you get to trust that they're better and that their ability is going to only make your stuff better. So ideas are important, but being able to execute, being able to put that faith in somebody else, I feel like that kind of goes along with the whole hobby thing. Like it's been really interesting to see how experiences when I was younger have now transitioned into, I can kind of relate them to why I do what I do. Mm -hmm. Do you think, I mean, you know, just being a director and you know, that being your, your, your career path, Do you feel like it took you a while to relinquish that idea of control? Because, I mean, you have to find people that can do a specific job like cinematography or, you know, like costume designer Mm -hmm. um, to be able to find those people and trust those people or like what, what's your idea? I've been, I've been really lucky that I've found through either producers or um, uh, a DP will suggest somebody who they've worked with in the past on a commercial or something like that. And I've been really lucky that I've been able to kind of off the bat meet a lot of people that I'm like, I'm going to collaborate with that person forever. Uh, My editor, Sarah Beth Shapiro, uh, she's done both of my features now, and she's going to be my forever editor. Uh, My cinematographer, Michael Reagan, has uh, has done all my shorts, and then he's done uh, my two features now. Mm -hmm. And uh, each time I feel like I find more people, (laughs) somebody outside is getting crazy. We got some some, hitting the windows. Some wild stuff going on outside that (laughs) we both cannot see. I also, Um, I feel like the mic's probably not picking up any of it. And so it like, be. maybe, yeah, should we bring the mic over there? Nah, <laughs> incite something. Yeah. yeah. Have, you, have you ever had somebody try to break down the, the glass and uh, like come yeah. in? Yeah. Yeah. This is, a, this is an air, a fun area. Like it's a wild area. Yeah. It's a definitely, definitely, <laughs> definitely a wild area. Yeah. And I mean, this, this glass is, um, I, I'm not exactly sure what it's made out of, but it's very, very strong. Cause yeah. we've had people pounding on the glass throwing stuff at it probably too oh like when you're not even here i bet like at night somebody's there's bound to have been something along those lines oh yeah yeah definitely i mean considering how close we are to like skid row and everything and yeah it's wild yeah. yeah uh anyway yeah i i feel like going back to your question it's it was actually fairly easy for me to relinquish control because it's not relinquishing control you at the end of the day get the say and so if somebody brings you something and it was your idea but it's not executed right 
you can tell them. Mm. And there's, it's not like a, a hard feeling sort of thing. Like I think people that I work with have pretty thick skin for the most part. I never have to do that. But if I did, I, I have no problem with that because I know that it's just, I'm just trying to make my movie and they know that they are a part of that. Yeah. So, uh, but I also feel like the people that I've worked with just are so good at what they do that it made it very easy to relinquish that, that like pseudo control. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I th- another funny thing that I've found is that a lot of times, even if you don't know what you want, which I feel like I'm pretty confident about what I'm wanting at, all, at most the uh, most turns. Mm-hmm. When somebody comes to you with a question, I heard a director tell tell people, or I, I think feel like this is something that people say uh, all the time. But having an answer is important, whether it's wrong or right is another story. Mm. But if somebody comes to you with a question and you say yes or no or this or that, at least just saying something now is important instead of it being like I don't know, let me think about that starting something being kind of ha- trusting your gut and then at the end of the day if it's wrong being able to admit that you're wrong and then they can fix it or do something else i, I found that almost all like 90 percent of the time or more when somebody asks a question and i yeah. have that initial gut instinct answer that ends up being the right answer mm. uh and and just learning to trust that and then trust the people who are executing that yeah uh it, it's been fun it's actually way less I, i'm not necessarily a control freak uh, even though I'm a director and I have director friends who do so many takes and, and that's their style and they do tons of passes on their scripts. And for me, it's more about like, I want the overall feel instead of it, all the minutia, the minutia is fun, but the minutia isn't going to make or break your movie. The movie itself is what matters, the overall picture of it. Mm. So I try to focus on the grand scheme of things. And then if something is very important, being able to tell people yeah. this is incredibly important, this one detail, and then they know. And instead of making everything a battle or everything being like life or death, then they don't. People don't know what's the most important thing because yeah. when everything's important, nothing's important. I like to mm. figure out those things ahead of time and say like this thing is incredibly important, and other things might kind of pop up along the way. But don't worry about that stuff as much. This is the most important thing right yeah, now. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think that's just a. Uh, good life lesson in general is to be able to filter out when to pick your battles Yes, and when things are super important to focus on and when other things can be kind of like, I want to say stowed away, but more, more so, um, you can just let go, Yeah, you know, and under, yeah, understanding when to let go, I think is, is very important. Um, I've had to learn that in releasing movies too. Like mm. trailer may not be exactly what I'm looking for, mm. whether it's, um, like a, a song choice or something, but at the end of the day, just saying like, what's the most important thing is, is it that the, the song change or that most people are happy and the distributor's happy. This is their thing. Like learning to pick those battles is incredibly important. Yeah. I'm, and I'm, I'm sure that that goes with life as well, like you're saying, but uh, I've learned that on the back end of making a movie. Cause I've been pretty fortunate that I've been able to make exactly what I've wanted now, two mm. movies in a row. Uh, but once it gets in the hands of a distributor, that's their movie and you get a say and you get to kind of have those conversations, but they're, they're kind of now the director. Mm. And that's been an interesting learning experience, but I've also felt like it's made me um, more of a collaborative person. I already felt like I was collaborative, but that part is, it's hard to kind of like have a baby and then somebody say, we're going to make it, we're going to put your baby in this onesie. Mm. And you're like, ah, I like this other color more. And then you have to kind of step back and say, I don't know. It doesn't really matter though. Mm. Like they're happy and they're, I don't, I don't know. That, no, it's a I, weird I, example, but I like, understand. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of, yeah. Cause it is a child. It's like putting a child out in the world and then somebody else, all, somebody else is getting to say, okay, so this is how we're going to pitch your child to this, this like class of students. Like yeah. this is their, their bio. And you're like, I would put this part of their bio in or that they like this food. And they're like, I don't think that's important. So it's, it's a collaborative experience, like trying to figure out how to, how to promote your baby. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's good to understand when to let go of those sort of neurotic things that we keep inside. Yeah. I don't know. I think like the process of creating things, you know, the things that you're neurotic about, could, you can either learn from or it can, they can kill you. And then a year later you also go, well, why did that matter so much? That happens a lot too. Yeah. Where, yeah, I like, 
I had things about my trailer for self-defense that I wasn't the biggest fan of, but now that it's been out and everyone like tends to like it and it leads people to the movie who maybe wouldn't have seen the movie had it been a little bit of a weirder trailer. Mm -hmm. Like I go, what did it really matter? Yeah. And I, I don't think it did. I do think that there's something to having a sense of passion about something and, and being emphatic about some stuff, but also being able to say, at the end of the day, it still works. And, and I've been able yeah. to do that. And I feel like that's made me, uh, made me a better filmmaker. Mm. Yeah. Even yeah. just on the back end, which is so weird because that's, that's a different part of your brain, but it matters, but then it doesn't at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I mean, it's hard to be objective about things when they're so close to home, especially when you wrote it and you put all this time and energy for the past, you know, three or four years yeah. into the script that, you know, especially, you know, going through what you went through, you know, I think like, yeah, it's, it's hard to let those things go. But I think that's what the interesting thing is, is that life in general will challenge you. I mean, it's, you know, I, I think like this idea of, of stoicism is super important to be able to be in control of your own thoughts and yourself and understanding that there will be things in life that will try to uh, control you or throw you off, but to be able to deflect them or, you know, disarm them or, you know. And, and then going and, back to what we were saying too, yeah. just like, just being able to say at the end of the day, I'm still me. Yeah. Like, even if this is not exactly how I would have done something, it doesn't take away from the fact that I am still my own person. Definitely. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all fascinating stuff to me. And me too. Uh, yeah. it also just talking to friends about their releases and comparing notes. And it's always interesting. And I, I couldn't have been happier with the way that our film was released. Bleecker Street bought the movie before we even made it, which is kind of crazy, mm. um, especially for an independent film. And uh, now we're on Hulu and people can watch it. And are, I'm getting people reaching out all the time. And Twitter's been cool. Just like I don't need to read every single review and, and all that. I'm yeah. happy with the movie I made. But I also I'm not one of those people. Like there are a lot of directors out there that – I think that you're you're kind of told that this is a cool thing to do where you're like, I don't care if anybody likes it, I made it for myself. And if you don't like it, it's like, I made my movie. I made the movie I wanted to make, but I also still want people to see it. Mm-hmm. And I want my distributor to make their money back. And I want to be able to make another one. And at the end of the day, you're making you're making entertainment, even if it goes to a darker place and somebody might not be entertained by that element of it. It still overall is supposed to be, even if it makes somebody think that's a form of entertainment in a weird way. Uh, so I always try to like go at it and say, how can I make what I want to make, but also like some, I, I still care. Like I still care what yeah. people's opinions of it are yeah. and not letting that dictate how I make my movie or choices I make. But like, yeah, I, I think if you are creative and you make something that you, that nobody likes constantly, that's got to break you down having a little bit of a win here and there is important. Yeah, definitely. Not to be like, I feel like that's like the least artsy thing to say is like, I kind of still care what people think, but I do. I I think 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 a lot of people do. I think that's an honest thing. You know, I I think like it's very romantic to just be like, no, fuck everyone else. I'm going to make what I want to make. And, you know, and, and that could be potentially like a, an immature thing as well. I've also heard, I've recently even just heard a story about a director who everyone knows of as one of those people who's like, Mm. fuck everyone else's opinion. This is my thing. And like, if you like it or not, it doesn't matter to me in the slightest that they read every single review. And like when there's something that they did where it was the first thing where people like really overwhelmingly liked that they were so happy that people Mm. liked, but then in the public eye, they went back and did an interview like the next day and like, I don't fucking care. But like behind the, I think that more people have that, that even the harder edged, like uh, out, out in the open, their personality, their persona is harder edged. I think a lot of people still have that honest, like desire to be liked by other people, or at least to have somebody appreciate, even if they don't like what you do, that they can appreciate the, the effort that you put into it. I would say that that's actually more important that even if it's something that you don't dig, but you appreciate that there was thought put into it. And that thought maybe isn't the same, that doesn't have that same effect on you, but you can at least appreciate that, that effort. I think that's more important than anything else. Maybe, yeah. maybe to be a little bit more specific about it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I think, uh, and in varying degrees, but, um, you know, I think it's good to have a certain amount of affirmations, you know, and to help you balance your ego out. Because I think, you know, there's like this idea of ego death and those sort of things, which I think are kind of more romantic philosophies. Sure. I think it, the more nuanced conversation should just be, how do you have like a, a healthy ego? Yeah. And I think he also having something you said just made me think about, it's not like 
if somebody who has completely opposite taste as me doesn't like my thing, that's fine. But when I know that somebody is incredibly intelligent, we have similar perspectives or similar tastes or whatever it is, or there's a critic who happens to have very similar tastes to me uh, and is, is has a sense of humor about the way they go about things. If they like something that you do, that means more than just like Joe Schmo. Oh, yeah. Um, Definitely. And so like ha- not putting too much stock in people you don't know. But when somebody you do, even if you don't know them, but when you respect what they do, mm-hmm. if they dig it, like if, if a musician reaches out that I'm a fan of and they say, self-defense was cool, it means a lot. It's really cool. Cause yeah, like, especially definitely. if that was somebody you listened to when you're in high school or whatever it is, there's, oh, yeah. that's been a really interesting thing too, is just all of a sudden becoming friends with bands that I've been fans of for a while. Me too. Like, yeah. uh, me without you is a band that I was a really big fan of oh, yeah. and I still am. Uh, but they, I've become friends with them over the years full of hell guys because of working on the movie, like reached out with them to them while I was writing this movie. And then oh, I'm trying to think of like not name droppy stuff. Cause like a lot of these bands, nobody still knows who they are, but, like, <laughs> uh, but it something means something to me. Definitely. And, uh, yeah. that's been cool. And, and, uh, or when directors dig your stuff for, yeah. I don't know, even just with my first short that, like really broke out uh, and did well called the cub when I started hearing from directors that they had seen it at festivals at Sundance or whatever it was and that they liked it. That meant so much. Cause like, and then now I'm friends with these people and it would mean just as much if they said that they like something now or they had thoughts or opinions on how to make something better. But yeah, that first initial thing where you start hearing from people who you admire and that they are into stuff that you're doing, there's kind of not a better feeling than that. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I think I think that's super important, you know, to have um, and also, I mean, you know, to have those sort of like pure affirmations and uh and obviously you would hope that people aren't just lying to you and blowing smoke up your ass. And you can tell, like, definitely. I, I've definitely, yeah. like I've, I've done the handshake thing with people before where they're like, great movie. And you're like, you don't really like it, but that's okay. Yeah. And I also feel yeah. like there's, that's kind of nice that people aren't like, I don't want everyone, I don't want somebody to come up and be like, your movie fucking sucked. But I also wouldn't, <laughs> yeah. I would, I would be yeah. okay with somebody saying it wasn't for me, but like, I saw that that part was cool or that thing. I saw what you're trying to do with it. I would be totally fine with that. Yeah. Um, well, now that you've had some time to be objective, with of course. It as well. yeah. yeah. And I think as long as you like what you're doing, that kind of criticism isn't a big deal. Definitely. Like I, I have fairly thick skin. Um, and you have to, yeah. And I yeah. know that it, even if everybody on like all the producers think that one idea is weird and that maybe it should be tweaked, but I believe in that idea. And, I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like I, I can make that choice and mm. say that executive decision, I trust myself. I'm going to do this Yeah. nine times out of 10, it works out. And then Definitely. the other times I, I'm not afraid to admit to them, you guys are right. I should have tried this or whatever it is. Yeah. But on set, I'm usually pretty good about saying if I'm ever even remotely nervous about something, doing an alternate version, mm. there's nothing. And that's the cool, that's the luxury of being able to shoot on a set is being able to do that sort of thing. Whereas Definitely. you don't get to put two versions of a painting up and ask like, if you like this one, cool. And then if you like this one, cool, but don't look at the other one if you don't like Mm -hmm. that. Yeah. That you don't get that same sort of thing. So it's, uh, uh, that experimentation in the edit is, is a a very important process. It's like writing Mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. I mean, even, you know, putting together like a gallery show, I mean, you can still have that editing process where, you know, you I guess you're right. I didn't really think about that. Yeah. you You put it on the wall and then you're like, you know what, this, this looks better there. And, you know, you kind of curate an experience for other people based off of the work that, that makes you sense. Yeah. Yeah. So it's very similar. I, I guess that's what I, I find interesting about just like talking to like a lot of different types of artists is be, is that sort of spirit that is imbued within an, a painting or a film uh, or music. I mean, that can be carried on to various other mediums. And, you know, speaking of like the jack of all trades thing, I mean, if, if you allow yourself to just be informed by the process, like you can learn so much about that and life and everything in general, which yeah. can uh, inevitably, hopefully give you peace in what you're doing. And I think that's just an ideology that I've been continually trying to ingrain within myself, this idea of peace as you go about, like not being hyper anxious about like your creation that you put out there into the world or Mm -hmm. those sort of things and just being okay with, and not in like a delusional sort of way, but being okay with the things that you put out there and, you know, 
whether they it's received well or not. Yeah. Right? Be, trusting that there was intent behind it is exactly. important too. Yeah. And trusting yourself. Yeah. 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 You know, what's, you know, what's really funny is uh, one of my friends was telling me that he uh, played a show one time and I think this was at the Troubadour and he said, uh, he said one of his friends and the, this guy's kind of like a, just a general potentially like hyper masculine sort of dude. He's like, uh, after the show, he was like, yeah, hey man, thanks for coming out. You know, what'd you think about the show? And he's like, oh man. <sighs> yeah. Great venue, huh? Oh, wow. <laughs> and it just like, I don't know. After he told me that it just stuck in my head. I'm like, wow, that is awesome, man. It's I mean, so I've, funny. I've yeah. had, I've had some after screening yeah. moments with people where you have to like, I'm, I'm not a dick and I would never like just say something horrible to somebody's face. But yeah. sometimes it's so incredibly hard to find out, like figure out something nice to say about their thing too. Mm. And that's a tricky place of like, you should be happy. Like, how do you, how do you like lie, but not at the same time? Yeah. And I, it's very rare that that happens, but I've, I, I think we've all been there, um, whether it's music or anything else. And, oh yeah, like trying to be a good person, but also not blow smoke up somebody's ass is, is a tricky thing too. Yeah, definitely. In a creative space, especially because creativity is so like personal and taste is subjective, obviously. Like my sis, I, the fact that my sister, my sister's an artist and the fact that she in college, like all of you guys have to, or I don't know what your background is with school, but like the peer group thing mm-hmm. where like peer reviews peer, yeah yeah peer reviews she, uh, there's just some of the things that she would show me her piece and i'd be like oh my god how is anybody going to say anything negative about this this is so cool this is like the coolest thing you've ever done and then she comes back and she's like got torn apart like literally every single thing they could have said wrong about it they did and like sort of in tears but she's got the thickest skin now and she also used it to eventually be able to say i made what i wanted to make and some of the older stuff, obviously, you could look back and you go, oh, they were maybe right about that. Like my first short, I do not like. <laughs> and mm. at the time, I remember loving and being so sure it was going to get in all these things. And now I can look back and say, yep, makes sense. It didn't get into a single festival. I totally get it now. Mm. But uh, now I think if if somebody doesn't like my thing, it's like that's their perspective. And I appreciate that. But most important thing is that yeah. I'm, I at least made that this was an active choice. This is why I did something. Definitely. Yeah. And I think that is a testament to you discovering more about yourself and finding out, you know, who you are more as a filmmaker and having conviction with that as well. And understanding that there's like, you're, it's only going to continue to happen. Exactly. Like growth yeah. never stops. Mm. Uh, hopefully. Um, if I, if I stop growing as a person, uh, then there's hope, there's there's something wrong. Like I, I want to always be learning and and trying new things. Definitely. Yeah. 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 Well, I'll ask one more question. And um, do you have any advice for artists and creatives? Man, we've been talking a lot about that kind of stuff. Actually, I feel like being yourself is very important. I, I feel like doing things, not just waiting for things to happen, is is incredibly important. I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the this thing that I did with. So, I my short the Cub got into Sundance in 2013, and I went to that festival and I had a great experience and I passed out DVDs to everybody who wanted one. I brought I brought like 500 DVDs of the movie with me, wow. and after every screening, if somebody I t- I would because I I was before a feature, and I told people if you if you like the movie afterwards, just come up to me and ask me for a copy. I'm gl- I'll gladly give it to you because I didn't get to do a Q and A, so I would do like a little intro, and then afterwards people would just come over and. People would inevitably either walk by and I'd be like, oh, that wasn't for them. Or they don't have a DVD player, maybe. Um, but mo- a lot of people would ask for the movie, and that was really cool. Yeah. Uh, two, two people ended up seeing it on a screener um, at the festival, and the, they ended up producing my, my feature that I made right after that. And the way that kind of came about is that they, they were supposed to go to a screening, and they couldn't make it. So they watched Ike Cinema Link, um, and then they watched it at, at the festival. And they, but they watched it on a computer and then, uh, they, they reached out via email and said, in a couple of weeks, we'll be back in LA. We should meet and talk about what your next thing is. Like if you have any ideas for a feature or whatever. And I had already outlined faults, but I hadn't written it. And so when I got back to LA, the meeting was going to be set from two weeks from that point. So I got back to LA, uh, and I gave myself a day to decompress from Sundance. And then the next day I got to writing 
Mm-hmm. And I told myself that I, there was never going to be another chance. No producer was ever going to ask about this ever again. If you don't write this script, your career's done. Like I had, I went into that with that mentality and said, nobody's going to do this for you. This is your only shot ever. Obviously it was an exaggeration. There would have been other chances and the script ended up getting passed around and doing pretty well, but I just had to have that mentality. And so I wrote the script. I had the meeting with them in that two week span, I wrote the script, had the meeting with them. Uh, pitched everything. They seemed really into it and they asked to read it whenever it was ready. I told them, and like, I did finish it yesterday. Let me just make sure I didn't mess anything up or have, I don't have any glaring plot holes or anything like that. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll send it to you guys right after, right after that. Uh, and then send it to them. And a week later, they said they wanted to make the movie. And I, I re- had remembered hearing this like anecdote and I don't know if it's true and I don't remember the producer's name, but that he was talking to a guy at a bar and this guy was trying to be a writer and the producer, knowing that this would happen, said, if you come back in, in a couple of weeks with a script, whatever it is, quality, we'll, we can fix it after the fact. But whatever that script uh, you come with to me with, I will make. And then he shows up at the agreed upon time on the day a couple of weeks later and the person didn't show up and obviously didn't take that chance and run with it. Mm. And he, I, I, that anecdote always stuck with me of like, nobody's going to do the work for you. You have to do it on your own. Like th- it's, it's all up to you. And so I've always kind of had that mentality of, well, I guess I should start this because nobody else is going to. And so I'm trying to be better about that in every aspect of life. But in terms of my writing, um, there's a moment where I kind of always just have to stop and say, like, fucking stop. Don't wait anymore. Just do it. And inevitably, once I do that, I always have a great time writing, but I always like dread that that blank page is always so nerve wracking. And then once you write that first sentence, even that feels right. And you're like, because the first sentence you feel like is so important because it sets the tone. And then once that's there, you go, oh, this is easy. Like, I know how to do this. So Mm. I just always have to kind of like push myself to do it. And then it always kind of it snowballs and it it, it gets more fun as it goes along. Um, But yeah, that would be my biggest long way of saying nobody's going to do the work for you. You've got to do it yourself. And whether that's going out with an iPhone, like everyone says, and like, just making a movie, like whatever, like you can do it on like Tangerine did it. Uh, I, I do think that there's truth in that. Even if it's like that movie also had more going for it than maybe like your little shorts going to have, but yeah, do, do the work. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, that's super important to constantly put yourself in the mindset of executing ideas. Yeah. You know, whether it's um, creating short, like shorts or creating, you know, even short stories, just being able to constantly output and you can filter it along the way. I mean, you yeah. don't have to put, you don't have to put it out. Scripts out yeah, out there, no, you know, they all you led created. to something though. Yeah. And, and they were important for their own way in their own way. And uh, yeah. And I, I, and you can also, it's okay to go back and say, I actually don't like that thing anymore because you know that it led to where you are now. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for doing this, man. Dude, thank you. I really appreciate it. That was great. This. I'll, yeah. ha- I'll have to come back in a couple of years and talk about jujitsu only. And and we'll have like our very jujitsu nerdy conversation about like <laughs> favorite techniques, yeah. like worst injuries. Yeah, yeah. Worst like, injuries. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man, I can have a whole podcast about I can't. That. Yeah, I, I would listen. Yeah. Well, thanks, man. Dude, thank you. Appreciate it. Music for the podcast is by Rarebit, a.k.a. Justin Dosher Hopkins. Creative producer is Kelly Kekich and editing help by Matthew A. Paul.